you have to do it by observing which way up these sedimentary strata are. Are they overturned or are they simply tilted in this fashion? So geologists must also then look at the sedimentary strata and read the record of the strata and determine which way up they are. And by, by determining then the orientation, the dip and the strike that is, and determining the way up of the sedimentary strata, geologists can piece together from isolated outcrops such as those here, the structure of an area. Now sometimes the dip and the strike is very clearly visible in the landscape of an area as it is in this photograph from England where the dip is toward the left of the screen. In this case, in the foothills of the Rocky, the dip can be measured toward the left of the screen also on a small outcrop. The strike runs away from the camera, as it does also in this outcrop. Imagine it like the roof of your house. In the Arctic, the exposures are very clear, and the dip and the strike and the way up of sedimentary strata is very easily determined. But in more bushy country, obtaining orientations for strata, even finding the strata themselves, is really rather difficult and a very different task from working in the Arctic. Even finding an outcrop is sometimes a problem. And in northern Ontario summers, it's often not very comfortable. The way that detailed geological investigations can be used to interpret a smaller scale structure is described by Dr. Riddler of the Geological Survey. Rocks deform in uh, two fundamental ways. One is to break or uh, fracture and fault. The other one is to uh, deform plastically or form folds uh, due to compression of the rock uh, this way. We have here an example of rocks deforming to form folds and we see the uh, original banding or bedding in the rock forming beautiful series of folds here. Now folds are basically of two types. They are either anticlines in which the beds become older towards the core of the fold or they are synclines in which the beds become younger towards the core of the fold. Now how do we tell this in this particular rock? We have here one bed which shows a fundamental feature. You all at one time or another have taken a handful of dirt, thrown it in a glass and watched while the coarser material settled towards the bottom and the finer grain material uh, came down at the top. This bed shows this feature. The coarser, lighter material is present at the bottom. The darker, finer grain material is present at the top. Thus we know that the bed faces out like this and hence, the fold is an anticline. It's getting older towards the core. The adjacent fold, of course, is a syncline. Now, during this deformation, uh, the rock recrystallizes to form uh, a different fabric than what was originally present. And you can see that in the rock here. This these series of surfaces which tend to be parallel to the core or axial zone of the fold and fan about it is known as fracture cleavage or foliation and it's a response of the rock to this crushing. Uh, in addition you can see minor folds on the nose and limbs of this fold. Rocks on the limbs of folds are sometimes stretched. And the way they behave depends on their ability to withstand that stretching. In this case, the main body of the rock is a sedimentary rock that was able to flow. But the diagonal band was a dike. And the rock of the dike, the basalt, or the igneous rock, was unable to withstand that stretching like the sedimentary rock and split into pieces. The fragments are now separated by an infilling of white calcite. When information is not available from the surface on outcrops, then information on the 
orientation of rocks must be gained from drilling. The angle of the drill hole must be carefully determined in order that the geometry of the rocks beneath the surface can be plotted accurately later. And the depth of the core must be accurately determined, in this case by determining how much of the uh, core barrel is still above surface. The core barrel is extracted from the hole in sections. The bit is removed. And the core of rock is then extracted from the core barrel. Racks of core can then be studied later in order to determine the uh, order of the strata in the borehole. Washing of the core often reveals the rock type more clearly. Core such as this doesn't tell us very much about the actual orientation of the rocks in the core or in the borehole, but what it can tell us is the depth at which a particularly recognizable horizon or rock stratum can be found. For example, if you think of this as one borehole, and then these as the neighboring boreholes, then it's quite clear from the varying depth at which these recognizable, or this recognizable layer is found, that the structure is an anticline, providing, of course, that the sedimentary layer is the right way up. So information from boreholes enables us to construct such interpretations of the rock structure at depth as this, the dark red dotted layer being a recognizable layer spotted very easily in a core. Let's get back to the mechanism of deformation of rocks, and in particular to what happens when rock fractures, because it's the release of energy when rocks fracture which causes earthquakes. A very well-studied example of a fracture or fault is the San Andreas Fault. You remember it from the program on plate tectonics as an example of a transform fault, a particular kind of fault in which the rocks slide by one another in jerks, of course, each jerk representing an earthquake. Very little vertical movement, mostly horizontal movement. And the horizontal movement can separate easily recognizable rock types, either layers of sedimentary strata or igneous intrusions. And by looking at the distance between those recognizable rock types, we can determine how much the fault has moved. So the San Andreas Fault is one on which we can uh, base interpretations of just what happens when fracturing occurs. The city of San Francisco sits near the northern end of the San Andreas Fault, where it goes back into the Pacific Ocean. And the fault plain is quite easily visible where it cuts the city, cutting through, for example, sports stadia and schools and hospitals and many pieces of otherwise quite desirable real estate. The fault is not just a simple fault, although the main San Andreas is well marked. It's a complex of faults. Los Angeles sits on a block which is moving to the north, and San Francisco is sitting stably. The fault plain is marked in some places by the occurrence of slick and sided or polished rock produced by the grinding together of the two opposite sides of the fault. The direction of the grooves or slick and sides gives us a good indication of the direction of movement of the fault. 